Hey, this is Pastor Jerry at Crispy Wesleyan in Ashboro, North Carolina. I want to thank you for joining us for the online message today. Hey, here's something I'm finding out. There's more and more people that are watching me. I was in an event this week in Randolph County, and I introduced myself to somebody, and they said, Hey, I, I see you on Facebook. So uh, it's, it's interesting how Facebook works and how uh, my face gets out there around. So uh, thank you for joining us. Hey, I just want to say this real quick. If you want to support us, we do a lot of ministries in the community. We're getting ready to do a lot more other things. If you'd like to support us, there's two ways of doing it. One is there's this online app called Tithely. It's easy to set up and you can just search for Crestview Wesleyan Church Ashboro, North Carolina, and give that way. Or another way is just give just uh, by sending a, a check through the mail. Here's our information, and you can send it to us, and we would greatly appreciate it. So let's go to what I'm going to be preaching about. I'm going to be in Mark chapter 11. I'm going to be finishing up Mark chapter 11. But right in the middle of Mark chapter 11, you, this is the story of where Jesus goes into the temple, that he is in there, and when he goes into the temple court area, he sees a bunch of stuff that he just don't like. And uh, he turns over tables, he runs people away, and it's just uh, he just causes a lot of havoc there. So this is on the Monday. This event happened on the Monday before Jesus is crucified on the Friday. But in today's story, he revisits this same temple courts, and there are some people that are really miffed with Jesus and what he did. So I'm going to read these last few verses of Mark chapter 11 and go through this. Man, there is some incredible stuff here today. I hope you follow me the whole time because, man, there's such good application for us today. So just follow with me as I read through these last few verses of Mark chapter 11. So in verse 27 it says, They arrived again in Jerusalem, and while Jesus was walking in the temple courts, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders came to him. By what authority are you doing these things, they asked, and who gave you authority to do this? Jesus replied, I will ask you one question. Answer me, and I will tell you by what authority I am doing these things. John's baptism? Was it from heaven or of human origin? Tell me. They discussed it among themselves and said, If we say from heaven, he will ask then, Why didn't you believe him? But if we say of human origin, they feared the people for everyone held that John really was a prophet. So they answered Jesus, We don't know. Jesus said, Neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. So as Jesus is back in the temple courts again on this Tuesday before he's crucified on a Friday, here are some people, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders confronted Jesus. And they were asking him, by, by what authority are you doing these things? Where did you get this authority from? So to understand this in context, to understand what is going on and why they're asking these probing questions, you got to understand these guys. First of all, it mentions that the chief priests. Well, the chief priests, their their job was was simply they were in charge of the temple. They were in charge of worship in the temple. So with Jesus doing what he did the day before in the temple courts, by turning over tables, by running people off. I, I mean, to the chief priest, Jesus was playing in their sandbox and doing things in their sandbox that they absolutely didn't agree with. So what they were up to, they weren't asking Jesus a question about authority to, to really find an answer. They were coming to Jesus, I really believe, and, and their question was more of a statement like, do, do you know who we are? Do you know what we're about here? Do you know that you're playing in our sandbox? So can you understand a little bit more why they came to Jesus? And we also, the other group, there was elders, but another group was the teachers of the law. Well, the teachers of the law, they were a 
professionally trained people that, that their only job was to teach and, and be able to accurately apply the Old Testament scripture. So if anyone had a question about the Old Testament, the teachers of the law were the ones, they were the authorities to, um, to answer all the questions. So, you know, I just thought about this uh, about a month or so ago in our denomination, we had something called the General Conference. And this is once every, I think, four years they get together and they 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 pass laws. They, they vote on a lot of stuff. They talk about the state of the church and all that. And when they go into voting and they go into the business part of it, what what our denomination does, which a lot of businesses do this when they're having meetings, they follow this thing called Robert's Rules of Order. So there's there's a process, procedure about how to vote and how to bring up votes and how to comment and point of order and all kinds of things that's going on there. And and see these the leaders of our denomination aren't greatly trained on Robert's Rules of Order, which nobody is really, but there are some people who are. So I, I noticed a few times when our when our head person of our denomination was uh, was going through the process of some voting thing and wanting to find out if somebody could speak, if somebody could amend uh, a law or whatever, that he would turn around and look at a couple of people and they would instruct him on how to properly proceed. Well, see, that's what the teachers of the law were supposed to be when it came to the Old Testament law. If you needed to know anything about the Old Testament law, how to interpret it, how to apply it, that they were the go-to guys. Well, we're thinking about that, the teachers of the law. And remember that Jesus, one of the things he did in Mark chapter 11 is he used scripture against these guys. He used Old Testament scripture. He applied Old Testament scripture to these guys because Jesus said, wait a minute, you're, you're making this place a busy shopping center, a noisy shopping center. This is supposed to be a house of prayer. He's quoting Isaiah. And then he says, but you've made this a den of robbers, quoting the prophet Jeremiah. So, so see, what was going on here was a whole lot more than what we see on the surface in scripture, right? So so Jesus was was upsetting the apple cart again and and I want you to I want you to think about this. Th- think about this. Here is Jesus in the most authoritative place. He's in the temple of God in the temple courts and before the most authoritative body in Israel, the chief priests, the teachers of the law and and elders and he's being asked about his authority. Isn't that isn't that interesting when you step back and just see what's going on here? So Jesus, what he did to respond to their authority question is to ask another question. From what I understand, this is a, a typical way that, that that rabbis respond to questions is they ask another question. And Jesus' question it has to do with John the Baptist baptism and and he just asked the question did john's in in the new living translation of the bible i think uh, encapsulates this question better that jesus asked It, it says did john's authority to baptize his authority to baptize come from heaven or was it merely a a human thing so what jesus is asking a question is not john's baptism about john being baptized but John was a baptizer. He baptized people. And I'm going to get into that in just a few minutes. But, but, but there's three, three bases that Jesus covered that, that's just brilliant. Because when, when you look at this again on the surface, it seems to be an I- irrelevant question. It's like, what is, what is John the Baptist authority and baptism have anything to do with the authority of Jesus. But Jesus is just so superior to to humans. He's so clever. He's so brilliant in in what he does and how he he responds to people and the questions he asks. I mean, there's some things that I'm going to mention that I think it's just going to blow you away when I was studying this and, and contemplating this. I mean, Jesus covered all the bases here. To, to get them to understand. And, 
And and the first thing that that he asked was, well, the the baptism part, he, he is is the he, the Jesus asked the question. He says, now did John the Baptist authority to baptize? Did it come from heaven? And another word for heaven is, did it come by God? Because Jesus was also very smart. You don't say God's name in front of uh, the chief priests, the teachers of law, any of the Jewish religious people, because God's name is so sacred that you just don't use it. See, see, Jesus is so clever. He said, now did John the Baptist authority to baptize, did it come from heaven or did it come from merely humans? And see what Jesus did. This is so incredibly clever. It's because remember that the chief priests and the teachers of law and elders, everything that they that revolved around them had to do with the 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 temple. It had to do with the Old Testament law, and it also had to do with the Roman authorities. I mean, they could even go to that. So Jesus took all of that away from them. They couldn't use those answers. They couldn't use anything to do with the temple. They couldn't use anything to do with the answer of the the Old Testament scriptures, or they couldn't use Roman authorities to answer a question. Jesus said, there's only two things. Is it from, did, did this authority from John the Baptist baptist being able to baptize, did it come from God, or did it come from man? It's just so brilliant. So here's the, the second base that, that Jesus covered that, that is so brilliant because it has to do, this whole thing has to do, I believe, with John the Baptist baptizing Jesus. That's where they want to know about where, where all this authority came from. Well, let's let's think about this. And this is Jesus being so brilliant, so clever in, in asking this question because John the Baptist, as we read in Mark chapter 1, he's the one who baptized Jesus. And do you remember what happened when John the Baptist pulled Jesus out of the water from baptizing him? It was just an incredible supernatural thing that happened, right? It says here in, in verse 10, it says, Just as Jesus was coming out of the water after he was being baptized by John the Baptist, John the Baptist saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit desp- descending on Jesus like a dove. And a voice came from heaven that that said, You are my son, whom I love. With with you I am well pleased. See, See, here's the answer right here about Jesus' authority. See, all of heaven was behind and supported and loved Jesus. And and the question that they were asking, where, where did this authority come from? Here's the answer right here. Because Jesus' authority what was inaugurated right here when John the Baptist baptized Jesus because here is all of heaven supporting Jesus and giving him all the authority and, and beginning his ministry. Do you see that? Jesus was just so clever in doing this. But, but there's another part to this story, another another base that Jesus covered here. It, it says in verse 32, and it, it's in parentheses in, in the New International Version, it said that they that these uh, three groups, these chief priests, the, the teachers of the law, and the elders, uh, they, didn't, they didn't respond, they didn't know how to respond because they knew, because it said everyone knew that John the Baptist was a prophet. They knew he was a prophet. Well, a simple question here. What did John the Baptist prophesy? You, you see how great Jesus was? He just came to this earth to prophesy Jesus, right? And, and again, let's let's think through this. If you go to John chapter 1, I'm just going to hit a few verses here in John chapter 1. But in John chapter 1, this is a story of where the Pharisees confronted John the Baptist to see who he was. 
Who are you? What are you about? What are you doing? And here is, there's some verses that I'm going to go through where John the Baptist responds. So again, they're asking the question about authority. Who is, who is Jesus? And, and Jesus is asking him another question. It says, does it come from heaven or does it come from man? And here is John the Baptist responding to the Pharisees. It's the same group of people that John the Baptist is responded to in John chapter 1. In verse 23, he says, John replied in the words when they were asking him, who are you about? He replied in the words of Isaiah the prophet, I am the voice of the one calling in the wilderness. Make straight the way for the Lord. He's telling them I'm a prophet. In verse 27, uh, John the Baptist said, He is the one who comes after me, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. This all happened at Bethany on the other side of the Jordan where John was baptizing. Verse 29, The next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And then you go down in verse 32 and it says, Then John gave this testimony. I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him. He's going through the story of what happened when Jesus was baptized. And I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, the man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I have seen it and I testify that this is God's chosen one. Listen, guys. They knew. They knew who the authority was. They knew Jesus was the authority. Scripture says everyone knew about John the Baptist. And see, Jesus knew that they knew. Right? When you, when you put all this scripture together, they asked the question, John the Baptist told them, I'm the prophet, I'm the prophet, and I'm baptizing Jesus, and he is the chosen one. He told them that. They knew it. They knew it. But their answer when Jesus asked them the question, their answer was, we don't know. We don't know where the authority came from. You know what that says? This is a cop-out. This is cowardly of what they did, right? They, they knew the answer. They knew that Jesus was the authority. They knew that the authority of John the Baptist came from God. They, they knew that. But when Jesus put them to the spot and said, answer me, they wouldn't answer. Even though they knew. Do you hear me? They knew. But they would not answer Jesus. See, they, they wouldn't admit. They wouldn't admit what they knew. They rejected what they knew. Do you see that in the scripture? But but it, but the story here is that well, every time I preach, I mean, it's all about application. I mean, what does this mean for us, right? The story here goes further than the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders, because we, all of us, all of humanity, also know this answer. It just just follow me on here. All of us know the answer to who Jesus is, even to who God is. You know how I know? Because Scripture tells me. Look at, look at Romans chapter 1. Look at this verse here. It says in verse 20, For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. Here's something that, that we, well, one thing is absolute truth, is that in creation we see that when God created us, created humanity, we are created in the image of God. A lot of people have been trying to figure out exactly what that image of God is, what, what that entails inside of us. We are all made in the image of God. Here's what I think. 
I believe part of the image of God means that there's there's something about us that God has put in us that, that draws us to him, that, that brings us to him. Even, even when we're far away from him, even when we're living a life that's not of God, that there's something, the image of God, there's something that is drawing us to him. It One of the words that we use in our denomination that describes this is called pervenient grace. It's, it's we are being drawn to, we are being drawn to God, even though we're far away from Him, even though we haven't accepted Jesus as our Lord and Savior. God is drawing us to Him, and I believe that has something to do with us being created in in the image of God. Listen to this scripture from Ephesians chapter two. I, I believe it describes what I'm talking about here. It says in verse four, "But because of His great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ." Listen even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. So, I mean, I I know stories, and I bet you do too, uh, of people that when, if you could point to someone on this earth that, that would say, that person is hopeless. There is no way that they are ever going to come to Christ, that they will never come to Him. I've seen... I've seen two stories in my life where people that I have pegged, personally I have pegged, that they are so evil, they are so mean, they are so against God that there is no way on earth that they would find Christ. But God somehow, some way, kept drawing them to Him. And, and man, I've seen some incredible stories. And I bet you have too. Maybe you're one of the stories. So let me conclude this by, by saying this. One of the, one of, probably the most frustrating thing is a pastor. It is that scripture alludes to the fact well, it tells us the truth that we are all made in the image of God, but it also it describes to us that we're all being drawn to Him. And, and it is so frustrating as a pastor just knowing that if they would only accept Jesus and His obedience and the person of Jesus and the authority of Jesus, that that all of this self-inflicted mess that they're going through could could vanish, could go away. Their their life could be so much better simply by accepting Jesus in His truth and obeying His word. It, it's so frustrating. The people who who sit on the fence that 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 they know better. Romans chapter 7 talks about this. They know better, but they, they will not take that leap. They will not submit to the authority of Jesus. And, and there's various reasons, right, why, why people don't do that. Maybe they have their own personal agenda. Well, maybe if I go this way that some people won't accept me. Or, or, or maybe, you know, you, you, you love the world so much or the things of this world are so pleasing to you that, that you just don't want to let go of that stuff. But you, but you see, and I'm telling you, guys, I, I, I see this. The most miserable people that, that I know are these fence strathers, are these non-committers, are these cop-outers, that, that they know, they know if they only obey, if they only submit to the authority of Jesus, that, that everything would change. And see, you are being trapped by the deception of Satan himself. See, Scripture says that Jesus, I'm sorry, that Satan is the prince of this world. See, he wants us to love the world. He wants us to be pleased by the things. He wants us to, he wants us to trap us in the things of this world. Do you hear me, guys? See, listen, I, I bet you, I bet you this is happening as I said, there's it's it's amazing the number of people that are coming to me now. And says, you know, I'm seeing you on Facebook. I'm watching you on Facebook. 
I'm wondering if there's one of you right now that's watching this that that what I'm describing is you. That that you've that you've always been on the fence. That that you know the way, the truth, and the life, but you're not going to commit to them. You haven't committed, and your life is miserable. You you might be watching this, and it might be two a.m. And you're just looking through YouTube or looking through Facebook and says, "Who's this crazy guy? What's he talking about?" And you're listening to this, and you're going, "Man, I am miserable." And 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 yeah, I, I I've never committed. Well, guys, there's no better time than right now. Just just think about this. The authority of Jesus, the authority of God. Do do you understand when everything was great on earth? What was when Adam and Eve had complete authority? Are are they listened to the authority and obeyed the authority of God? It was paradise, right? But when we started doing things for ourselves and making our own decisions and getting ourselves full of pride and, and, and following the world instead of Christ, that's when chaos came, right? It, it, isn't that true? Listen to this here. Those who cannot be honest with themselves cannot be honest with Jesus. So guys, I, I just... This is it, guys. Are, are you one of those... Fence straddlers, are you one of these guys that, that just like in the story today with the chief priests, the teachers of the law and the elders, when Jesus asked them about the authority, they knew the answer. But they, they wouldn't submit. They copped out. Is that you guys? Just as a song says, come to Jesus. Come to Jesus and live. He is he is ready to pour out blessings on you. He is ready to pour out freedom on you. See, the, the thing is, it's so deceiving about this world is that, that people think that, well, I'm free because I can do whatever I want to do, and I can do whatever I, my mind tells me to do, and I want to do whatever. I don't want to be controlled by anybody, be under any anything's authority, even God's. Guys, when you do that, you say you're in freedom, but you're in incredible bondage, and you know it. You know it, right? There, There is just, there's so much peace and so much hope, so much joy in accepting the authority of Jesus. Guys, I'm just asking you to do it today. Can you do it? So if you got, if you're one of them, if you got questions, if you, if you want, want to ask me something, Again, here's the email address. You can uh, email me. You can call the church. We, we love to see you here live. Guys, uh, make a decision for Christ today. He, he's the only way. He, he's, he's true freedom. He is true life. He's the only life. Guys, accept him today. Be under his authority today. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for... Your word, we thank you, Lord, for Jesus and, and just his teaching, Lord, and and what it means to us. And and Lord, there's there's just too many of us like the chief priests and the teachers of the law and the elders, Lord, that that know the truth, that know who you are, that know whose authority you're under. But Lord, they're non committal. The, the things of the world have got their minds so clouded and and, and they, they exchange the truth for a lie. Lord, I pray that there are some today that accepts your truth, accepts who you are, and, and Lord, are willing to come under your authority, to be in obedience to you, to, to love you who you are, Lord, and, and to get rid of all these things, Lord, that the world is, is tempting us with and, and drawing us away from you. Lord, I know that there's many who... Try, who have tried to follow the world that are just living a miserable life now. Lord, we pray that you just, they accept you and, and, and Lord, you just fill them with blessings and joy. Lord, we thank you for this time today. Pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.